Welcome. I'm Dr. Len Calabrese from the R.J. Fazenmeyer Center for Clinical Immunology, welcoming you to TB testing in the 21st century. It's a great honor and privilege to welcome Dr. Xavier Meret from the Hospital Bicetre in Paris. Uh, Dr. Meret is one of the international authorities on the mechanism of action of immunosuppressive drugs, particularly biologics, and I've asked him to come and discuss TB and biologics relating the mechanisms of action of these drugs to the incidence and progression of TB. Welcome, Xavier. Thank you, Dr. Calabrese. I would like to share with you some data about the mechanism of action of uh, anti-TNF uh, and some differences in this mechanism which may explain uh, some differential risk of tuberculosis with these agents. As you know, we have now on the market five different uh, anti-TNFs uh, reparting in three classes. First, the soluble uh, receptor, uh, two uh, monoclonal antibodies with three drugs, and the last one, uh, which is uh, uh, the sertolizumab, which is the FAB prime two uh, fused to the PEG, uh, the PEG replaced the FC part of the IgG. Before commercialization, it was not known that there was an increased risk of tuberculosis. You can see on this slide uh, the summary of the side effects in the phase three studies with infleximab. And as you can see, the risk of TB had not been addressed in these phase three trials. It is only after the commercialization of uh, uh, the uh, anti-TNFs that uh, the risk of TB was assessed. As you can see on this slide, the 70 cases of TB uh, occurred. And what is very uh, particular is that they occurred very soon after beginning the treatment in the first three months of the treatment. So it means that these TB cases were not new cases of TB, but were reactivation of latent TB. And now in all the countries, there is a screening for latent TB before beginning anti-TNFs. In France, uh, we uh, set up uh, a couple of years ago a, a peculiar study, uh, which is a pharmacovigilance network for collecting all the cases of uh, tuberculosis and opportunistic infection occurring in patients treated with anti-TNF uh, all over the country, whatever the indication. Uh, this study was prospective, and during this time, we could estimate it that the number of patient years treated with anti-TNF was around 60,000. Uh, we also knew at that time the repartition of the use of the drugs in the country uh, depending uh, etanercept infliximab and adalimumab. So uh, we uh, collected pro prospectively 69 cases of TB. You can see that the median time since the last anti-TNF was 10 months, and you can see the repartition of the underlying diseases uh, in these patients treated with anti-TNFs. The first result of the study is that in two-thirds of the cases, the skin test was negative, uh, less than five millimeters, as you can see on the slide. So clearly, it illustrates the fact that we need new tests uh, for uh, the screening of latent TB. The second uh, result of this study is that we didn't observe any case of TB in patients who received correct uh, previous prophylaxis. So it means that when we treat the patient for latent TB, it is efficient. I just have to note that in France, the prophylaxis we use is a little different than the prophylaxis usually, uh, um, usually uh, used in the US. We use a B therapy with ANH and rifampicin for three months. We collected 69 cases, and here's the standardized incidence risk of TB compared with the general population. You can see that with a 12 fall increased risk of TB in this patient with anti-TNF. And you can also see there is a differential risk depending on the fact you receive monoclonal antibodies or receive uh, the soluble receptor. The fact that the SIR is 1.8 with etanercept doesn't mean there is no increased risk of TB with etanercept because you have to remind that all these patients are screened for latent TB. But clearly, there is a differential risk and this differential risk persists on the top of the figure if you consider only patients having received only one anti-TNFs. Uh, we uh, also did a case control study by including two controls by case. And you can see on the slide 
that the, two, uh, the three factors associated with TB were the age, the fact to be born in an endemic area, and the fact to receive a monoclonal antibody compared to the fact to receive uh, etanercept. There is another registry which found the same difference of risk of TB. It is the British registry, BSR-BR. There is the same difference, but the, the magnitude of uh, difference between the soluble receptor and the monoclonal antibody is not the same. Uh, it can be uh, due, as you can see here, to the fact that the incidence of TB is higher in uh, UK than in France with the intercept, whereas it is the same with the monoclonal antibodies. And it could be due to the fact that this registry began in 1999 at a time where there was no screening of latent TB. But overall, the results of the two studies are comparable. There is a differential risk concerning TB. Uh, with sertolizumab, we have uh, uh, very recent data which have been uh, presented at the French Congress of Rheumatology uh, concerning all the clinical trial with sertolizumab. And as you can see here, the incidence of TB with sertolizumab is very close to the incidence of TB with monoclonal antibody, 0.55 per 100 patient years. But we have to say that most of the, uh, these cases uh, occurred in East Europe where these clinical trials were uh, conducted. You can see that the rate is around the same that the RAC study with adalimumab, uh, which has been previously published. In a ratio, we also addressed the risk of non-TB uh, opportunistic infection. And we collected 45 cases of non-TB opportunistic infection in 43 patients. You can see on the slide the repartition between bacterial, viral, fungal, and parasitic infection. These infections are severe. Four patients died and 10 needed intensive care unit. The time between the last anti-TNF and the opportunity infection was uh, 8.7 months. Uh, you can see the underlying disease. And uh, again, uh, the uh, use of etanercept uh, seems to be uh, lower than the use of monoclonal antibodies. We did the K-control studies. And in, with these K-control studies, we found uh, two different risk factors of non-TB opportunistic infection. First, a steroid use, more than 10 mg a day. And second, again, the fact to be treated with uh, adalimumab or infleximab versus etanercept. So there is a differential risk of TB and uh, probably of opportunistic infection uh, with a different type of anti-TNF. What is the reason for that? Uh, to find against TB, against opportunistic infection, we need a granuloma. And in this granuloma, there are some cells, monocytes, macrophages, lymphocytes, and TNF plays a key role uh, to uh, control uh, the uh, tuberculous bacillus in the, within this granuloma, and especially membrane TNF. Uh, we need also to fight against TB specific T cells. And you can see on this slide uh, that the uh, T cells specific for, for, uh, for the tuberculous bacillus here on the slide, when you add anti-TNF, there is a decrease in the function of these T cells, decrease of proliferation and decrease of uh, gamma interferon secretion. And as you can see on this slide, uh, there is a decrease which is much more important with the monoclonal antibodies than uh, the soluble receptor at the dosage, which are the classical uh, dosage in clinic between 1 and 10 micrograms uh, per milliliter. We also found that the uh, T cells specific for the tuberculous bacillus have a, a, a lower uh, expression of membrane TNF when uh, these cells are treated with the monoclonals compared with the, uh, these cells treated with etanercept as you can see uh, on the bottom of the figure. So why is there this uh, difference? And what are the differences of mechanism of action between the drugs? Concerning soluble TNF, uh, both types of drug inhibit TNF uh, at the, with the same efficacy. But concerning membrane TNF, there is a much more stable fixation uh, on the membrane TNF on the monoclonals than uh, the soluble receptor. And this could have some consequences uh, in the cells expressing membrane TNF. It could be increased apoptosis, it could be dysfunction, and we are going to see these possible consequences. The first possible consequences is an increase 
of apoptosis by ADCC or CDC uh, with monoclonal antibodies than with etanercept. Uh, actually, apoptosis uh, has been uh, demonstrated with infliximab in Crohn's disease uh, in the lymphocytes uh, of uh, lamina propria of the bowel, uh, but there are controversial data about apoptosis uh, in rheumatoid arthritis. I'd like to share with you this data, uh, which uh, show the apoptosis uh, of uh, uh, the lymphocytes uh, expressing uh, membrane uh, TNF uh, by uh, different uh, uh, anti-TNF agents. And you can see that uh, etanercept uh, leads to apoptosis exactly like adalimumab and infliximab. Thus, with etanercept, you can have apoptosis. And it is clearly understandable because etanercept contains a FC part of AGG. So it is sensible to apoptosis by ADCC. Conversely, sertolizumab in red doesn't have any FC part. It is replaced by the PEG. And as you can see on the slide, there is no apoptosis with sertolizumab, conversely to the three other drugs. It is exactly the same with monocytes. So uh, we can conclude for that that uh, sertolizumab does not mediate apoptosis in vitro. So it suggests that apoptosis is not required for efficacy in Crohn's disease, because as you know, sertolizumab is efficient in Crohn's disease and etanercept is not efficient. Etanercept can mediate apoptosis, and it suggests that the lack of apoptosis is not the reason why etanercept doesn't work in Crohn and induces less tuberculosis. So uh, a second uh, consequence of this better uh, affinity, of this better stability to membrane TNF, could be a better internalization of membrane TNF. But today, we don't have any data supporting this hypothesis. A third hypothesis would be a difference in reverse signaling, which leads to inhibition of function of the cell expressing membrane TNF. So what is reverse signaling? In a cell which expresses the TNF receptor, TNF fixed on the receptor and induces a pro-inflammatory signal. But we have also some cells which express membrane TNF. And at that time, the soluble receptor, here etanercept, is going to fix on the uh, membrane TNF and to uh, induce reverse signaling. It is exactly the same with the monoclonal antibody, here the anti-TNF infliximab or adalimumab. But in this case, the fixation is more stable and reverse signaling is much more important, leading to different effects within the cells and leading to the dysfunction of the cell. A fourth difference uh, between, uh, a fourth consequence of this better stability could be a better penetration of the monoclonal within the granuloma. And you can see on this model of mice uh, of chronic murine uh, tuberculosis that the monoclonal antibody uh, goes into the granuloma uh, much more efficiently than the soluble receptor. Last, there is, between the two types of drug, a difference in inhibition of cytokine secretion by monocytes in response to bacteria. Uh, and uh, I'm going to illustrate uh, this uh, difference. If you take some cells uh, incubated with efferent anti-TNF agents and we stimulate these cells with LPS, LPS is going to mimic bacteria. And we are going to look at the secretion of the different cytokines after LPS stimulation. Let's see the results for interleukin-1. And you can see on this slide that when you add some anti-TNFs uh, to this stimulation, you inhibit the secretion of IL-1 uh, by these monocytes. This inhibition is around the same with sertolizumab, adalimumab, and infliximab. But you can see that the inhibition with etanercept is much less important than with the three other agents and it could be linked to a difference of uh, a fixation of membrane TNF and a difference in reverse signaling. So clearly, there are some differences in mechanism of action between the different anti-TNFs. So uh, to conclude uh, about the consequences of uh, these differences of mechanism of action, first, there is a higher risk of tuberculosis and non-tuberculosis opportunistic infection with monoclonal antibodies than the soluble receptor in at least two different registries. 
The risk of TB and of uh, non-TB uh, portuitic infection is, however, much less important than the risk of classical severe infection, uh, which uh, is uh, the same with a different anti-TNF, and this has to be in remind. Uh, the risk of TB is very low compared to the risk of classical bacterial infections. Third, the inhibition uh, of soluble TNF is probably sufficient uh, for uh, efficacy in rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, and rheumatic manifestation of ankylosing spondylitis. There is a probable relationship between, between efficacy of drugs in Crohn's disease, efficacy of drugs in granulomatose diseases, like sarcoidosis or Wagner diseases, a possible better efficacy of uh, the uh, monoclonal antibodies in ankylosing spondylitis associated with viritis and psoriasis. Uh, and all, in all these diseases, there was a better efficacy of monoclonal antibodies. But the price to pay for that, because in medicine, nothing is black and nothing is white, the price to pay is probably a higher risk of tuberculosis and of opportunistic infection. And last, there is this difference uh, of uh, effects is probably related to a better inhibition of membrane TNF with the monoclonal antibodies, probably in relation with a better stability of fixation on membrane TNF. Thank you very much for your attention.